Oh hi, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 234, I'm going to say. 234, it should be 234, yeah. 234, dos, tres, cuatro. How you doing? How you feeling, my friends? Good. Great. How am I? I'm amazing. Thank you for asking. Um, I've just caught back from a little run. No, sorry, not run. I went to the gym, actually. All my days are blurring into one. I went to the gym to this morning to do a little workout. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to have another run to do my two workouts in a day. I'm trying to do two workouts a day on a Monday and Friday. I think it's a good way to kind of book and to kind of start the week and to book end the end of the kind of quote unquote working week. Whilst everyone's outside, you know, getting fucked up and having a good time on a Friday. I kind of specify some time at the end of the Friday to go and have a workout. So that if I do decide to go out, it's going to kind of be like, um, it's going to be a bit of a chore, right? Because I'm tired, I'm sore, you know, I'm just in general fatigued. So for me to come back home, get changed, go work out, and then come back, get changed again and go out, it's going to require a real, real, real um, effort. And it's also going to have to be something that I'm really looking forward to going to. It's, going, it's not going to be some like wishy-washy thing. It's going to be like an actual event that I'm actually like, you know, you know I have to go to this thing. I can't not miss, I, I can't miss it, for instance. But yeah, um, here I am, man, feeling good, feeling awake. Sober October is we're into the third week now, aren't we? Sober October, I'm feeling fresh, I'm feeling good. I have to be honest. Um, you know, it's, you always, whenever you do stuff like this, you it starts to you start to realize just how much of an indulgent creature you are, right? I think I've kind of prided myself over the last few years that I've kind of maintained some level of quite some level of um, reasonable self control, right? Where I'm not allowing myself to get pulled and dragged into different situations that I'm not in that i'm not kind of um dictating myself right i'm not allowing myself to be influenced by people and i just try and generally kind of you know move to the beat of my own drum but of course as you progress through life as you get older as you get a little bit more lax you look up resting on your laurels you start to forget those practices and start those things that kind of held you together in the early days and i think for me personally, the last couple of months or maybe the last year and a half has been one of those kind of years where, you know, you've, I've kind of hit some kind of creative blocks. I've kind of been questioning the things I've been doing and, you know, just generally life has been a bit topsy-turvy. So in those little occasions of doubt, um, you know, you start to start to comfort yourself in the indulgences and the kind of quote unquote um, leisures of life. And, you know, by and large, as anyone knows, when you're trying to achieve things or you're trying to get somewhere, in your life where you're trying to you know actualize your dreams those things that you think are aiding you to relax or take your mind off things are if anything just exasperating the problems that you have they're just masking over the issues or they're just a band-aid yeah for this open wound that you have right this bullet hole wound you have and you're just taping up with a band-aid eventually that thing is going to drop off and eventually you know you're going to expose yourself to the elements and eventually it's going to be disease and all that sort of stuff so yeah it's not really a good way to go about things so now with this of october things what it's allowed me to do it's allowed me to kind of recalibrate and to kind of get things back in, back under the normal, back into order, right? For instance, like this is another good example. I DJed on Friday, so I DJed on Saturday. Great event, don't get me wrong. But usually, if I DJ on fr- Saturday, it doesn't necessarily mean I have to go out and get fucked up, right? But usually, when I DJ on the weekends, I use it as an excuse just to go out and have a good time. Now, immediately, I'm not going out and getting as wasted as I would on a normal Friday, Saturday because I'm working. I try and keep my drinking down to a minimum or down to like, you know, the bare minimum, like maybe a couple of shots before I start just to kind of get me loose. But I tend to kind of, you know, let the party go on and I get home late. I'm not going to get, but it's, but it's, it's better than going out the whole day and me drinking and getting high, right? So you end up doing that. But then what you realize is that when you're in sub October is that you don't necessarily have to do that. You just go to the thing that you're doing. So I had a gig. I DJed in a bar. He've got staff. My night called Labertees. Pick up everyone that came down. That was a, it was a good night. You can just go and play and come back home because it's essentially you are doing it's another it's one of my other jobs I do outside of my you know my usual nine to five right it's another thing that I do outside of it for another it's a hobby that I'm loving and I enjoy but people hire me and they call me or they email me and they request me to come play their bar to keep the mood going and to make sure patrons are still drinking all that I'm allowed and just create like a good soundtrack at night. So I could effectively turn that into just a job. I just go in, I do my job and I go out. Now it's difficult because everyone around you is wasted and high and drunk, whatever it may be, but it's effectively just a job. And I found it so so much more pleasurable to do. And I actually felt genuinely tired when I left the place that I couldn't get out of there soon enough. As soon as I played the last track at 1 a.m., I packed up all my shit, got paid, and just ran out, right? And went back home, had a McDonald's and just went to bed. So that can that can happen and i realized that oh you know what what ends up happening is that if i did it on a friday and then i've got a night to go out on the saturday i can do it but if i'm getting wasted 
on the day that I'm I'm DJing on a Friday, and then I'm trying to go out again on a Saturday. It's just going to be an absolute horror show. And I think as as I proved, or as I was, uh, or as as I realized when I went to Berlin recently, the other week, that you know I'm probably not at the level that I was beforehand, like raving wise. I'm not I'm not willing to do the things needed to kind of keep my night going, right? Because people, you know, you take in an inconspicuous amount of drugs and whatever, maybe just to keep your night going. And I'm not willing to do that. I don't want to fry my brain. So I'm I'm only willing to go to a certain level, and then after that, it's the point of no returns for me, no diminishing returns so much so. So I've realized that I have to kind of pace myself in a really educated manner, especially with the nightlife stuff that I do outside of it, whether it's taking pictures, whether it's DJing and stuff. I'm not the regular punter, right? I spend a lot of my time outside at night, so I can't necessarily afford to go out three or four times in a week because I'm DJing two of those times, two of those nights out of the week, and that requires prep beforehand right that requires traveling there earlier that requires having to set up it's quite tiring standing up the whole time it's a lot of work to get that thing to work in the way you want it to work so i'm really thankful for about sober october because a lot again it's allowing me to kind of get things back into normal and again this is going back to my this is what i did beforehand but i just i just kind of let things get out of control i was doing this before i wasn't drinking during the week i didn't have any alcohol at home i kept all my going out stuff for going out stuff i made sure that i didn't go to any random club nights during the week i just went on the friday or the saturday ideally on the saturday just to kind of make sure i kept the balance um i trained every day monday to friday without exception because i knew if i did go out on the friday or saturday there's no way i'll be training on the saturday so the the, the mandatory days of training or working out had to be monday to friday those were non non-negotiable and if i didn't have to go out on the on the saturday sunday and i didn't miss my workout i wouldn't feel as guilty i wouldn't feel as bad about myself but sometimes if i was aiming to imagine i didn't work out on a wednesday or i missed a thursday or friday and then i was aiming to make it up on a saturday sunday and i missed out of it because i had to go went out i feel so shitty i feel like a failure i feel like i'm cheating myself you know what i mean but now i have a mandatory monday to friday workouts there's no no negotiating about that there's no drinking between um those dates at home i don't have any alcohol at home and if i do go out it's like after my workouts are done after that 6 p.m time and again like i said if i plan to have two workouts um on the monday and friday or especially on the friday if i have two workouts a, a day one in the morning one after work it's quite hard to then come back home change and then go out again on that friday right because you've worked out twice you've had your nine to five job that you're doing um you've had you know talking to your colleagues doing your work running around town coming back home to the commute rush out of traffic on a friday and then you're working out after work and then you're having to come back home and shower and then go out again it's quite a lot of work so that you i'm creating these scenarios where it's only allowing me to go out in these particular times and also after berlin too I, I, I wouldn't mind just like com- completely curtailing going out we- weekly on the, in during the week in London, saving for the special events I'm going to, like for instance, the Inner Visions and that fold, and then kind of keep, and then maybe specifying some time during the month um, to go away for a couple of weekends, right? Go to Frankfurt, Robert Johnson, B- B- um, Berlin for Bergheim Panorama Bar, Greece Müller, and all these stuff, and, K- and Club Division here, blah, 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 blah um, about blank, right? Go to these kind of places, maybe Barcelona, maybe Madrid. Um, maybe go to Tbilisi, right? Um, and go to those kind of and, and go to um, what's it called? Bata, Bata, I've got the place in Tbilisi in, in Georgia, but that place, right? Like maybe schedule some time like that way. So have a weekend you schedule to go out and get fucked up, and then you spend the rest of your time and in the UK just you know chilling and trying to achieve your dreams. Because you know at the moment now time is running out kind of not so much but you know you can't stand still, you can't rest on your laurels. You just have to keep working hard, and I can't afford to just have you know days after days or weeks and then just kind of blocked out due to me just getting fucked up i have to kind of be on my a game so that's kind of the thing that i'm thankful for so october and again it's a standard thing we all know this already but you know it's good to know ahead of time um talking about Sober october so like i mentioned before i, I played at the keith cohen star yesterday for my night called Labertees, which is um i've got i've got it up on here on the screen for you guys to see so this was my night at um, the Heathcote and Star. It was really good, actually. I, I really enjoyed it. I had a good time, man. I'm not going to lie. I had a really good time. Um, again, I, I DJ sober, so that was a very interesting occasion to do. Um, I served my first kind of sober gig in a month there. It's a lot easier because obviously it's a bar. It's a bar pub. It's not really a nightclub, so maybe it's a bit of an easier vibe to do. Maybe a nightclub be easier because people don't really come to you because, you know, the, the DJ moves all over, uh, all over there. But um, great time great audience i got a chance to play some lo- loads of new stuff that i was happy to play loads of new new disco stuff yeah. a few house bits and bobs that went down really well and i just realized djing sober as well there's so much clarity of mind i had a real i was very attentive and very sensitive to what was going on around me i was able to kind of gauge when people were kind of in a lull when i was going a bit, a bit too hard i brought it back down again I, it was it was a very um 
it was a very response. I, I had a very responsive feeling to the crowd. I could re, I could just react to them instantly, right? Um, I was also a little bit more mellow when it came to people interrupting me during the set and saying, "Oh, can you play this? Can you play that?" It was very very mellow. Um, I was very cool about that. Um, and just in general, just a great great set. Um, and my recognition was good too. I was able to remember what I had on my USB and be able to pluck things out of the um on my mind that I thought would work really well. I organized my playlist a lot better than I would have done previously. Of course, I still I did it to the wire. Why is it we always do this as DJs, right? We always pl- rec- put our plays together like I don't know a couple of hours before your set starts, right? So I was just at the on the wire if I can get stuff in replica box and dragging it down to my USB sticks. But thankfully, it, w- it all worked out in time. And yeah, generally it was a good night. Um, I was planning to kind of make this a T-shirt, this little liberties thing. A uh, flyer. I was gonna have the liberties on the front and then have the no have this picture on the on the back. On the front, sorry, in a little square image on the front here on the chest, and they have that liberties in the back with maybe the date on it. But I didn't have time to do it, and the place that I went to go print it out was closed on the weekend, so maybe I'll do that during the week when I get another gig confirmed. I'll just make some t shirts just to kind of have to myself aware. If someone wants, a, wants one, I can just give them to one. Um, that, that'd be quite cool. I'll do a promo thing, but yeah, by and large, good night, man. I enjoyed it. It was a good night. Great to get back out there again. Like I said, I ain't DJed in a while, but it's been about four weeks since I DJed last again since because I went on holiday, so it was a set in between that I missed. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of just, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a weird month in terms of uh, DJing gigs because essentially all the students have gone back are going up or down to uni, wherever they are based. So sometimes the gigs can be a bit dry in that regard. But I was happy again to DJ again. It's one of the best hobbies I have in my life of, I've discovered in my life. Um, it's been really good the last few few years or so. And yeah, this year's probably been one of my most busiest years in terms of bookings. I've been basically booked. Every, I've been I've, I've played at least a minimum of, of twice every month for the last year and a half or something so that's been really good and yeah it was, it was a good occasion i enjoyed it again like i said dj server is great i was I, i've had an, I had my old blue suit on electric blue suit on that i bought from top man ages ago so i think i'm gonna start doing that as a thing going forward now maybe taking some of my dj fee and just especially if, since you work if i work nine to five it's easy because that money is not really money that i'm counting on living on just extra money i might just take the money that i earn for my dj gigs just go buy a fucking top man suit every month just a different one and just wear that when i go to go play the gigs just to kind of be a bit i don't know i just like the idea of walking in and having that kind of like suit on it kind of lends itself to my dj name handsome black man it kind of there's a good synergy between that um again it's probably a little bit more on the is his name the magician or mr Arab? is it mr. the magician yeah that dj called the magician i think i missed it before right the magician i think it's called the magician the magician dj i think that's his name right is it the magician the magician yeah that's him yeah there's this guy who used to dj with the airplane back in the day who kind of has a suit on a wears all time he does a lot of electro and disco edits and stuff and he's always wearing a suit and he looks fucking incredible of course made himself to the magician kind of similar it's like a bit of a hide Aikerman suit there with the straps on it but yeah he's always got he's got quite a good style i like him so um, maybe something similar to that. and the other guy what's the other dude that all the girls like is it gustafostein gustafostein is that his name is that gustafos Gustafo Stein, is that Stein or something? Stuff Gustafo Stein, is it his name? Is that his name? Yeah, that guy, uh, this this French suit that all the girls like. He's he's got a pretty good style too, right? It's just like a black suit, white shirt, no tie. Um, again, just kind of lending itself back to the kind of you know being an actual artist as a DJ, right? It's hard to do have a bit of persona there, but I think that works quite well. Lends itself well to the name. Again, something different. I don't usually wear smart outfits at all when I'm when I'm when I'm in my regular day to day life, but I think I work out pretty well. I might do something similar to this as well in that regard. Now, I mentioned um, I think Dennis Salter started to wear suits too, right? For his new um, EP, is it EP or album he's putting out soon? Um, he's 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 wearing a lot of suits now at the moment too, so everyone's kind of going down that kind of lane at the moment. But yeah, um, I wore an all, all all electric blue suit for the occasion I was DJing, and yeah, I had a good time, man. Got a great time playing there as always. So thanks to everyone that came out for Liberties again. All my DJ all my DJ are put into my um, on my website. You can check it out at axinozinger.com. I have a link in the show notes if you check it out on my website. All DJ dates are on there. I update that quite regularly. So keep an eye on that. And obviously my resident advisor page will be on the list as well below. So you can check out my dates I put on there too to make sure you catch me when I'm playing. <sighs> I think that's it, right? Um, let's jump into some topics, isn't it? Let's get into some topics. It's got loads of stuff to talk about. Loads of stuff I've got on my list of things to go through. Um, so let's get let's get in on it. Let's get in on it. So number one topic to go on is Elliot Kipchoge breaking breaking the two, the sub two hour marathon time, which is nuts just to say out loud, isn't it? Somebody, there's a human out there that ran under two two hours, right? <laughs> and half ma- or oh, sorry a full marathon which i don't know if we if we just specify if we just spec that out in terms of times on the calculator right 
So let's say you say what you ran <laughs> one hour fifty nine, right? <laughs> you uh twenty six. What's that? So you ran each mile basically effectively. You ran a six minute mile like, average, maybe less than that every mile for twenty six miles. That is insane. Six mile. That's like, just insane. But yeah, Eli Kachogi was able to break that um record the other day. I watched it live in the morning before I went out for my run. It was very motivating, I have to say. I usually try and watch like David Goggins clips on his Twitter, but now he's doing the Western States 250 mile races, of that, so it's not really uploading as much. But I was able to catch a bit of this um, live stream on YouTube where Eric Chubby was, was kind of running through the thing. And I've got it up here on the list, so you can check it out on your Twitter. But there's videos uploaded Elliot everywhere. On it. It's just amazing, man. Oh! So amazing. And he was able to kind of run into the arms of his wife and children at the finishing line. Such a cool dude, Elliot man. Kipchoge cool as a cucumber. Just like, no, I mean, like nothing ever Vienna. happened already before. Imagine that. Imagine running 159. 159 is the official time he ran. Super chill. I'd be having my shirt off. One I'd be. If, if, honestly, if I was at Kachobi, my shirt would be off. I'd be running up and down the street naked. I'd be screaming. I'd be doing loads of that America. Like, yeah! Right? He's just super calmly running to the, the arms of his wife and just kept things moving. Do you know what I mean? It's like, Jesus Christ, man. You just broke the flipping record mate come on <laughs> react more she's like eh, minor thing you know what i mean so so cool to see but the details behind it are just insane because again you have to imagine right he ran the hot the whole marathon in the time he, he ran just basically my fastest time running a half marathon was one hour 47 minutes 47 minutes right and i was in barcelona and i think after that i ran probably 149 in chippenham and i think maybe the, the hackney half marathon which killed me I ran maybe 2005, right? So he ran quicker. He ran a marathon quicker, right? Full marathon quicker than I ran my last half marathon at the Hackney Half. That is just insane how quick that is, how fast that is running. And there's actual videos of people that are running next to him side by side recording to see how just how quick he was running. You hear the breathing of the person that's recording the video. You're like, shit. It's like, um, I remember my little brother went to go see um the, um, the Tour de France. I think the cyclist, cyclist by the by Canning Town or somewhere around there. I forgot what 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 um, race it was, but he said like you you don't you don't understand how fast these guys are going until you're like on the road watching them zip by you. And it's like whoosh, whoosh. so imagine running what what a professional marathon runners must look like when you're up close and personal, especially when you're running yourself. Right, I ran myself like three miles or so a day, uh, maybe more if I'm feeling in the mood and stuff. Right? Yeah, so I know how what it is to run quickly or in my head to be running quickly. So I can picture. I've got a better reference point from it. So when I'm standing on the side and I see someone like Ilkin Chogi just running by me and he's running a half marathon at the same pace that I'd probably run maybe a 5K, it's just insane, insane. And some of the facts behind it as well are even more illuminating. I think there's a really good article here. Oh, let me just get this off. I always kind of forcing all these dumb applications to load. Come on, get out of here. There's a really cool article here on BBC actually that kind of mentions just how quickly he was going. Let me get up on here. And just to kind of get in that perspective. And again, it's just w funny because these things, same, similar to skateboarding, when someone does a trick that no one else thought was possible, it immediately opens up the floodgates to everyone else to start doing it. Because I don't know what it is about the brain. I don't know what it is about human nature that suddenly when someone does something and you realize it can be done, or automatically something in your brain just kind of clicks. You're like, oh, and it, it just becomes reality. It's not something that you question anymore. And this is what, the, this is kind of the scary thing happening now for the future. Or mm, future? Yeah, this is this is a scary thing that we have to kind of uh, be aware of or kind of anticipate. Like, how fast are the kids coming up watching him walk, run, right? So the kids are 15 and under in school and shit running, you know, professionally or running as part of a course or as part of a club or they've got scholarships or they're at university running for their track team. Imagine what this performance must do to them and for their confidence and what they're going to think is possible and what they're going to think is achievable, right? You already got you already got that kid. Is that White, White Lightning, that American kid that runs super quick? Um like and he's really young so imagine what's going to do what it's going to do to a new generation when they see someone like Elika Chogi running a half a fucking full marathon in one hour 59 minutes it's just insane um so it's a really good article on the bbc kind of kind of breaks down exactly why this is so important uh la, la, la. so this is a, some another video of it as well again right running this down is history line. unfolding on the streets of vienna this morning it's a saturday run like we've never seen before listen at the insane. noise the, the stride pattern right is awesome him him him. through hard He's essentially just like, look, 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 look how far up his heels are flicking to his bum, right? Um, the body posture is just leaning forward just ever so slightly. Just an absolute beast of a man. Work 
He's pointing at everyone that he's seeing, like, so, so, so cool. So anyway, this, this article from BBC says, Eli Kipchoge breaks two-hour marathon uh, by 20 seconds. Eli Kipchoge has become the first athlete to run a marathon in under two hours, beating the, the mark by 20 seconds. The Kenyan 34 covered 26.2 miles in 1 hour 59 and 40 seconds in a 1, one hour 59 challenge in Vienna, Austria on Saturday. It will not be recognized as official marathon world record because it was not an open competition as he used a team to uh, retain his pacemakers. This shows no one is limited, says Kipchoge. Now I've done it. I'm expecting more people to do it after me, which is amazing, right? Um, the Olympic uh, champion who holds the official marathon world record at two hours and one minute. So it's not even like he's out of his realm, right? Set in Berlin, Germany in 2018. Oh, actually, that's what I'm thinking about doing, actually. The Berlin Half Marathon. Uh, next year i think it's sold out for the most part in how how many days are sold out for the burning half marathon uh where is it yeah it's sold out still no it's not so the allocation from 1000 to 15000 runners is already sold out so i need to jump in quickly so i think i'm going to decide in the next couple of weeks if i'm not going to do it but i feel I'll, i think I'm, i think i will it'd be a good time just to kind of go out to berlin have some good time go Bergheim. or no actually go, run a half marathon in the morning on a sunday and then go to Bergheim on the on the on the in the afternoon right i, I do think running a half marathon that's a flipping good schedule i think it's the afternoon i think it's the 5th of april the berlin half marathon is the 5th of april yeah it's on a sunday so you can go run the half marathon and then when you finish, go shower, change and then go to the Bergheim. Like, pfft. do you know what I mean? Absolutely perfect. So I'm going to probably do that um, coming up very, very soon. Uh, anyway, let's go back to Kipchoge here. So the Olympic champion who holds an official record, knowing he was about to make history on the home straight, the pacemakers dropped back to let Kipchoge sprint all over the line. You know, it was really good. They had like a weird like trying, like a V formation. So Kipchoge was sort of like at the base of the V. Right uh, at the bottom of the V, and then he had like two runners and like two runners, like you know, um, divided in front of him. And then they had these lasers on the floor that were essentially the pace of what he had to keep in terms of where he had to be. And the pacemakers were they, they kept rotating. I don't know how many miles I think they kept doing some sort of 5k, they kept doing like three and a half miles each. And they kept rotating, and another group of pacemakers would come in, and they'll keep running with him. It was fucking awesome to see. And then just as they got to the end bit, he did, they all just dropped off, and he started sprinting in between the middle by himself. The four-time Mar- uh, London Marathon winner embraced his wife Grace, grabbed the Kenyan flag, and was mobbed by his pacemakers, including many of the world's best middle and long-distance runners. Kipchoge, who compared the feat to being the first man on the moon in a build-up to the event, said he had made history just as Britain's Sir Roger Bannister did when he ran in the first sub-four-minute mile in 1955. I'm feeling good after Roger Bannister made history it took me another 65 years I've tried but I've done it this shows it's possible is the positivity of sport I want to make it a clean and interesting sport together we can run we can make it a beautiful world yeah of course what what a, what a beautiful man absolutely nice message with a leading like this, this this is the scary part right with a leading pace car beaming green lasers on the road to in- indicate the required pace of 2.5 um 2.50 kilometers uh, per kilometer, sorry, minutes per kilometer. Kipchoge never went slower than 2.52. To break the mark, he had to run 100 meters in 17 seconds, 422 times in a row. Now, for those of you listening, I do a little bit of CrossFit endurance, right? It's this really cool workout that um, Brian McKenzie kind of spearheaded that essentially is a combination of CrossFit and endurance training, right? So for people that want to run and want to get really fit, but also don't want to do the you know insane mileages that people do when they're running half well when they're doing normal runs when you do like a couch to 5k or you do like a couch to half marathon you know you usually you know you usually go around usually in the between the 10 to like 25 miles mileage a week right again it basically it's, it's the kind of methodology of like in order to get better at running you just need to run more well brian mckenzie's got this incredible method where you don't need to run as much as you do in a normal running method but essentially you do a lot of uh sprint workouts so a lot of like 100 meter repeats 200 meter repeats 400 meter repeats 800 meter repeats and sometimes a thousand meter repeats right and the idea behind that is to keep a consistent level of pace and cadence so that when you then go and run your full distance race you know how to keep that cadence and that pace up so that you don't you don't drop your split times right so i've got used to i've got, i've understood how hard it is to run consistently right around the track or around whatever it is or that upper road uh, a specific distance for a specific time again and again and again so for him to run 100 meters 17 in 17 seconds 422 times in a row is just insane how quick he's running that consistent pace where you just can't drop because sometimes you know we've all done half marathons or we've run long distances before 
sometimes a mile two and three are your fastest and then mile three you're essentially just holding on for dear life right and then you get to the end of it and you just sprint at the end but essentially you, there's loads of dips and divots right you're just essentially telling your brain look i'm going to give you a bit of rest for like you know i'm going to give you 800 meters worth of rest and you're going to get you're going to crank up again but imagine running at that elite level where you're essentially sprinting the whole time it's just insane how much the level of athleticism and talent that's involved in it is just insane but with that being said i'm still not looking at this as like this is unachievable i'm still looking at this as like you know if i trained hard and i committed myself to this training life and i commit myself to running which i have done right like i mentioned before i don't think i'm naturally a long distance runner i don't think i was naturally born to run long distance but i've made myself into this person i think if i trained hard enough i could probably do that or get close to it i think so you just have to give yourself to it you have to dedicate your life to it. you have to run more than i've ever run before i have to you know there's loads of things i'm gonna to have to do that i probably won't willing to do right now but if i wanted to do it i probably could do it, i think so and again that's the whole point of him doing it right it's like to inspire people like me the average you know working man to think you know what that's possible i can go do it too but yeah um it's just incredible 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 story um so he ran it in he ran it 100 meters in 17 seconds 422 times in a row he was 10 seconds ahead of the schedule at halfway mark before appearing to slow um with a few 252 kilometers only to regain the pace and kick on again that's in, that's where your real athleticism comes in right where you're able to slow down you're able to get fatigued and then kind of find another gear like that's just insane um Kipchoge was in assisted by a team of 42 pacemakers including Olympic and Olympic 115,000 meter champion Matthew Centralwitz and Olympic 5,000 meter silver medalist Paul um Chalimo, Chilimo and uh and the Linebrider brothers um Jacob and Philip and Henrik they rotated in and out um, running in formation around Kipchoge with former 15,000 and 5,000 world champion Brendan Leggett anchoring the final leg they're among the best athletes in the world. So thank you, added Kipchoge. I appreciate them for accepting this job. We did this one together. Kipchoge coaches delivered him water and energy gels by bike over 4.4 laps of the 5.97 course in the city park. In instead of having to pick refreshments up from the table as in all competition marathon runners, these aids are not allowed under the rules of the IAF, IAAF, Athletics World Governing Body, which is why he will not be recognized as a feat. That's the only thing. Because he got given gels on a bike. Come on, man. That was superhuman. The attempt was uh, funded by uh, the Petron economics company, Ionos, owned by Britain's richest man, uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who also sponsored the cycling team with the same name. But yeah, look at that, man. Look at the split time. That's just insane. <sighs> he ran a 5K in under 15, 15 minutes. Just, you know, I don't know about that because the quickest 5K I've done is 25. So he, yeah, he ran... Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's just insane. He ran a 10K just over the time that I ran a 5K. Wow. I can check his request. The course consisting of 2.2 2 miles and 67, 2.67 miles stretches and two small loops so that each end was lined with spectators. Unlike his previous attempt at Nike breaking Project Monza. Okay, he asked for people to come down. That's awesome. Nike also provided him with a new model of the shoe that has been worn by athletes running the five mile mile. The innerest team will selected the first. Uh, the, but yeah, just incredible. Incredible performance by everyone involved. Well done, Kichogi. Absolutely smashed it. And again, inspiring people like me, average Joe blogs here, to think that I can go and do it too. Probably can't, but why not think that I can do it, all right? Why not think that I can do it? Because if I train enough, hard enough, why not? He's a human just like me. And if he runs, I can run, right? Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's get to the most of that. <laughs> 25 minute, 5K man thinks he can run a 1 out of 59 marathon. Ha <laughs> ha. 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 What's next here? Chris Brand does coke. Who cares? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who cares? Who cares? This is a story that keeps rumbling on and on. Whenever someone happens to be in the same vicinity as Chris Brown, preferably some sort of dimly lit light club or some celebrity field event, someone inevitably catches him, catches him, quote unquote, doing cocaine, right? Which is very odd because it's not as if we didn't know this, not as if he wasn't obviously doing this previously in his, you know, in other occasions that we've seen him do it. But why are people consistently, this is why I don't get, right? Because I, I think maybe I'm not, I'm not celebrity obsessed. I don't really give a shit in general about these people, but I'm not give a shit. But, you know, I'm not you know, necessarily in a space where I'm going to be around these guys and girls. But I think if you're somebody that is celebrity obsessed and you want to be in part of that world, why would you go somewhere like that? Betray Again, he doesn't know who, who you are, where you are, because I'm assuming this video looks like it's been zoomed in from like the other side of the room. But why you be why you betray the trust of your peers and people that you're with in the space and recall someone like Chris Brown doing something like this? I assume in those kind of glitzy, highbrow, A-list 
celebrity space is that there's probably a few other people doing some sort of illicit activities whether or not it's drugs or partaking in activities that aren't you know that all the way legal or whatever it may be there's people doing things you know that they're just doing because they're in a safe space because they're around people they're around people who have as much to lose as they do right so the understanding is that look we're always going to keep each other safe and i think having come back from berlin especially after having come back from the Bergheim, you know and you hear people all these hollywood actresses that went to the Bergheim you know incognito and went there had a great time and you just you just you're you're pretty sure whenever i'm in the Ber- Ber- bergen i'm pretty sure i'm gonna bump into a celebrity or two right and i always told myself that if i did bump into one i wouldn't be like oh my god look it's that person right i'd just be super cool if i bumped into him and we happen to cross paths but like, hey what's up i love you this whatever just keep it moving because i wouldn't want them to feel as if like somebody is here spying on them right i want them to feel as if oh, i'm gonna get my phone out i want them to be completely caught and chill and just to know that look i'm a fan i love what you do you know what i mean that's all it is um so having come from this kind of place, you start to realize just how important, as good, as great as um, putting a sticker of your phone is for us punters, right? Regular people that go to these kind of clubs. It's probably more important for the person that has something to lose, right? Because they at least have the opportunity to be in a space for once that isn't a private members club, that isn't some snooty, you know, faluti hotel somewhere where they can actually have a dance, get fucked up, get all sweaty, not care about what they look like, because that's something you have to realise too, but most nightclubs, especially those kind of nightclubs that are set up in that way, they're not necessarily, you don't, you have to go there and show out your best outfit, you're not there being, you know, the, you know, having the new thing on, no one really cares, you have to, you're, basically everyone's there appreciating the music for the most part, so imagine being a celebrity or somebody of note, or somebody somewhere to lose, going somewhere, just letting your hair down, right, just being free, being able to have a dance, chill out, talk to your friends, get fucked up, you know, just whatever, just especially with your friends. Imagine be, this is the only time when you're not, maybe when you're not in an Airbnb or in some like hotel or in your mansion somewhere in Beverly Hills, which is probably not as fun, right? Uh, I imagine getting fucked up in the Beverly Hills mansion just with you and your friends isn't as fun as being anonymous in a crowd full of thousand people dancing to thumping techno on the Bergheim main floor, right? Um, so being able to like reconnect with your friends again in that kind of environment, maybe your friends miss having you around in that capacity because you're this big celebrity person that they can't necessarily go to a club with anymore because you get stopped or you get taken, people ask you to get pictures or autographs all the time. So being able to be with your friend who's as high, this celebrity person, just be able to chill out is amazing. But you have people like this who record a video of Chris Brown doing coke in a nightclub and you're like, why are you doing this? And also, why do you care? But I'm also happy that for the most part, I play in the background because there's no sound to it. But, you know, he's at the whatever doing whatever he's, he, he wants to do it at the at the back of the nightclub. I'm also quite happy that for the most part, no one seems to care. Right. The only people that care a lot about this are, I don't know, people that recall shit. Is. It seems that for the most part, the Internet doesn't really give a shit that he does what he does outside. now, And I'm liking because I think I hearken it a little bit to council culture a little bit in that regard it feels as if we're suddenly we're moving on a bit i think counter culture obviously still affects people that are in the mid to low tier of celebrity or notoriety in general right i think sometimes you can't there's there's only some there's only some, some amount of bounce that you can do right because you if you get if, if if you're in the middle to low class of a celebrity or somebody of influence there's going to be a couple of jobs that you already have that are in the works that will get taken away from you immediately right any appearances that you get, you you were scheduled to do will get cancelled. So usually it's hard to bounce back from those two hits because usually you're working check, check to check, you're clear your checks from the other appearances haven't haven't cleared yet. But when you're at the top tier, you have enough residual income, you have enough income streams, right? You money's working for you while you're just sleeping. That even if they decide to cancel a couple of your up and coming appearances, you just have to weather out that storm, weather the storm for like a couple of months, and then once that storm weathered out. Those guys will come back around again and you'll be back on normal again. But for the middle to low tier, they can't really afford to weather out a storm. But I'm happy to see for the most part, if you're a big if you're a high enough person or high especially somebody like Chris Brown who's gone through enough adversity as it is, he's he's been people have attempted to cancel him numerous amounts of times. It's now got to a stage where like, you know, like people accept that he's quite not problematic, but he has he's a person, right? He has um he has flaws. He has public flaws. He's not afraid to kind of show them. He's not afraid to be vulnerable online, right? That pitch, that image, re- that uh, clip recently where he was tweeting his, Im- he was commenting on Rena's picture and saying, "Oh, he wishes he was a lamp." Right now, he's selling the lamp in his merch store. That, that he's not afraid to act a fool in public anymore. He's kind of, he's kind of suddenly finally accepted the meme of of he's a bit of a train wreck, which has kind of helped his kind of p- public persona. People have kind of accepted him for the most part, and he's insanely talented right it's one of those kind of things you have to realize that he made some mistakes when he was younger but by and large he has kept his nose clean no pun intended and you know just kept doing his thing but i just can't understand the the the, the outcry behind stuff like this especially in hip-hop where it seems as if you know i love little got it for instance right one of my favorite new 
up and coming rappers at the moment. Uh, the brother of Little Kid, he was on No Jumper a few a few kind of episodes back, and he was openly asking, um, you know, Adam if he wanted a perk, right? He was popping perks while he was while he was talking to him. He had a perk in his cup. He was fucked up, right? Completely fucked, and whatever else he was doing beforehand. And that was seen as, you know, oh my god, he's going crazy. And he came back the next time and tried to clean his image up. But it's a really, it was a kind of accepted thing. No one really said nothing about it, right? People get fucked up on lean all the time and no one's really making a big deal of it. You got videos of people double cupping and sipping lean or what appears to be lean or whatever, maybe prescription drugs. And it seems to be part of the charm, right? Part of the character of the person, part of their package. But say that same person whips out a little tray a little mirror and racks up and does a couple of lines everyone's outraged oh my god it's crazy how you doing it's like i don't understand these double standards like and what's worse for you really right coke is really hard to get and really expensive prescription drugs by the most part for the most part in america are quite easy to get a hold of right especially on the black market um especially if you've got some sort of ailment or some sort of injury or some sort of medical condition you can get hold of prescription drugs quite quite easily and alcohol is easy, you know, for the most part, if you're over age or if you're of age, you can get alcohol anywhere you want to. So what's more, what's more, what's, um, what has a worse effect on you or is to your detriment in, in the long term? Coke, that's hard to get hold of and very expensive or prescription drugs are everywhere and alcohol. It doesn't mean, and especially in LA where weed is illegal too. It's like, come on, man, well, why are people freaking out so much? And, you know, if any, if we know, if we read anything about books in terms of musicians from back in the day, I've got one here actually that kind of speaks about it here. See if I can get it from my back. This book here, right, um, called Please Kill Me, The Uncensored History of Punk. This is from the punk days, right? You know what was popular during the punk days? Heroin. Heroin was a big, big drug back in the day. Heroin. Not cocaine, not cat, not pills, not molly, not MDMA, not prescription drugs. Coke. Heroin. But it was a comment, and then, you know, as, as the cocaine epidemic, you know, flooded the US market, that also started to take a hold. But that was the biggest drug back in the day. And everyone used to do it. It's just an open secret that everyone was doing um, cocaine, right? Or doing some sort of drugs. I've got this other book called uh, Please Meet Me in a Bathroom that also um, kind of details that whole era of people, especially during the indie scene. It's just part, parcel of the entertainment industry, right? And I've always mentioned it prior, 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 I think even with my comparison with someone like a Ben UFO and a, and like a Ricardo Villa Lobos. I'm sorry, but I'm the type of person that likes to see my DJs having fun and getting fucked up. Like that David Vunk guy from Holland that I saw play at the at Dick Mantle and Boiler Room a, a couple of years, oh no, or last season. And I thought, oh shit, this guy's awesome. And I followed him and I saw him play at Greece Milo went to go Berlin. I quite, I like my DJs a bit of character. I like them a bit, you know, a little bit off kilter. Because part and parcel of the reason why you got into music was the feeling that it gave you when you were younger. And you, I don't know, you might have done a couple of things here and there. And it kind of gave you this weird feeling. You're attached to the music. You, you, you identified with some of these people. You might have got involved. My friend, a couple of parties, and suddenly now you're part of the culture. So to see a DJ out there that's like you know clean and proper and you know not really doing much and you know all about the yoga and the fruit juices, you're a bit like Ugh, it's not the same. This is just me personally, right? So I quite like my my entertainers and my um you know my free thinkers and my weirdos and you know in, in the celebrity world to be a little bit off kilter. It quite it makes them a little bit more endearing, right? For all the ills of Kanye West recently with this whole Jesus stuff. It's quite cool to see that he's quite a divisive figure even now in his forties, right? He's still Courting, courting controversy even when he's in the church it's quite interesting it's a bit more interesting than a vanilla sort of taylor swift whose biggest issue was the fact that Kanye West ran on stage and you know took away her five minutes of fame right ages ago that's her biggest controversy in life but for the most part everyone else has been fucking safe into the to the book and really vanilla that's not really interesting i want my de- my intention to be a bit more you know a little bit have a, some lifetime so if, if chris brown wants to go out there and do some coke and have a good time let him enjoy himself i don't see the issue here I really don't. If you get your music on time, if he performs at festival, if he performs his concerts, if he tours around the world, doesn't really miss shows, for the most part puts on incredible performances that go on for fucking two hours and he's dancing the whole time, singing live. What are you to complain about? I don't care. If he's doing coke, give him more coke to keep going to do the tour and continue putting out. The- no wonder he's making albums that are like 55 songs deep. There's no way you can do that if you're, if you're fucking sober. You just get tired and want to go home. <laughs> so I don't get But again, I'm happy to see for the most part, no one really cares. Everyone's just kind of chilling out. And again, to the person that recorded the video, you're a loser. You're an absolute loser. To be in that space in the first place, right? To be around the celebrities, you're obviously trying to get in and around the scene. You want to get up the ladder and you want to, you know, whatever. Cool. Just hang out and be a good, good, and be a good, to be good company. Don't betray the trust of people in that space and be the only person. Because she looked at the only she, that was a, he or she was the only person recording, or the video, the only video that kind of got out of him doing it, like zooming in and recording Chris Brown. It's just like that's why those that's why it's so important. Places like Bergheim exist, those safe spaces, or even private members club like So House and all that sort of stuff, or Shoreditch House and stuff. Like 
that's why that's why they exist right because you need somewhere to go to if you're somebody of influence or somebody whatever it may be that you can go let your hair down and chill out and have a good time without people recording you and trying to end your career quote unquote but again you can't really end chris brown's career do you know what i mean he's, he's made too many good songs he's too talented he's got too much money um unfortunately if you're a level just below chris brown or under or just at the bottom of you probably shouldn't be doing that right you probably should need to stay away from any kind of controversy and just keep your head down and keep it moving but yeah um I don't care. I really don't care. And again, shame to that person to record the video. Like, get a life, man. Honestly, get a life. Anyway, next on the list here, we have... Oh, Hot 97 being Hot 97. This is an interesting article just because it's Hot 97 doing what they do best. I mentioned previously about the whole Takashi 6 9 ish- issue, right? Um, the whole idea behind it's going to be a paradigm shifting thing. It's going to really shake up the industry and shake up the, you know, how people view hip-hop, especially the people that came from the, the streets with hip-hop or came from you know, really the, the origins of hip hop, right? The idea behind breakdancing, DJs, um, the idea behind it being kind of closely affiliated with gang culture in some regard, right? Those, it's going to really question all those things that we know, all our preconceived, all our pre-assumptions, because, you know, effectively from what we know, Takashi 6 9 is cooperating with the, with the feds and he's kind of, you know, basically snitching on his fellow co-defendants in terms so he can get a lighter sentence. He's rejected, um, um, uh, witness protection and he, he intends to come out of prison and re- resume his musical career right because he has to what else can he do right he doesn't have any other job or life skills for the most part he's got his face completely covered in tattoos so it makes complete sense um but then news uh, news kind of came out recently that he also signed a 10 million dollar deal and i think part of the reason why i was talking about it the other day was that it's gonna be interesting because so far we haven't seen any backlash from radio stations from record labels from concert promoters from arenas from venues saying we're never gonna have this guy play again i think the only people that banned him so far is a barclays right where he where this, allegedly they were shooting up the the place um you know trying to intimidate casanova or something during that court case start saying they're talking about right so that's a new place i think so far he's been banned categorically but for the most part he's gonna find it pretty easy to probably travel i think for the most part he's gonna have a, he's gonna have an audience in europe he did that european tour that was really successful um, where you met West, Westwood was touring around with him and that went really well. So we haven't seen the industry react so far to what's happening, right? All we've kind of seen is just artists kind of, you know, that hip hop artists, older statements, older statesmen, like, you know, Meek Mill said something about him, Tutu said something about him, T.I. said something about him, like everyone's G. Herbert or something. People are coming out and saying things like calling him a rat or whatever. But for the most part, the consumers and the people at large who are going to cut in the check have kind of kept quiet, right? The consumers who are going to provide him with the people and ensure he pockets aligned and, uh, labels who might front the cash in order to make sure that he goes on tour have kept quiet but so far the one person to break their silence has been hot 97 of course right hot 97 maybe makes sense because you know they are new york's most well-known radio station maybe not the biggest breakfast club power one and five and breakfast club probably taken over from them but in terms of just that you know um legacy name hot 97 is very close to associated or you know married or you know joined to the hip hand in hand with hip-hop in the new york scene general by and large so it makes it's probably of it makes it's probably um makes sense that they come out and say something but it's just like hot 97 to um adopt this really weird moral stance in a situation that has nothing to do with them right so tmz are reporting that hot 97 um aimed to not play his music right unless right this is a weird weird kind of like fucking um disclaimer at the end of it but it's an article from tmz it says the following new york um city's biggest hip-hop radio station to catch um says the catch six nine will not get no spins once he releases for music unless the snitching rapper's music forces their hand right which is d- insane if you're gonna have a moral stance behind what six nine did which you probably shouldn't again because it doesn't involve them they're not in the streets they're not of the streets there's nothing about Hot 87 that is about street culture, right? The amount of time they ban 50 Cent, for instance, and people of those kind of ilk for being quote unquote related to the streets, having so, some sort of problems at the radio station is insane. So for them to suddenly have this stance doesn't make any sort of sense. But if you're going to do it, go the whole way. Don't say unless the public forces their hand. It makes no sense, right? And it continues. An executive from Hot 87, probably Ebro, um, tells Hot 97 tells, tells um, TMZ when Takashi is released from prison and drops new music, the radio station will not jump on to debut any of his records they don't anticipate playing any of his music at all which is really re- moronic because we sh- we're, we're, i'm pretty sure i think takashi was trolling ibra for a minute right um was trolling him to get an interview and they never got an interview at the end of it uh, most of it had to do with maybe because he had some inside info about what was going on about the case maybe they were just a bit shy maybe they were just shy about asking after he went on breakfast club and completely smashed their viewing records i don't know but it seemed an, it seemed like an easy layup for them right they love to con- call controversy they want to be part of the conversation because you know they're effectively been left in the dust with the breakfast club so they're always trying to insert themselves in there whether it's 
Rosenberg taking some corny backpacker hip hop ideal um, point of view behind some issue, whether it's Ebro saying something inane or trying to be a troll, which is not really a troll. He's just a, a, an old dude that's chat shit. Um, you know, there, there's always an issue. They have a, the sound guy had an issue with Joe, but there's always something they're trying to get themselves involved in or inserted in so they can kind of be part of the conversation and effectively not that, which is, you know, again, admirable because nowadays with, um, with the, how quickly media is changing and how quickly these meme pages and these kind of, um, hip hop news page, meme, hip hop Instagram pages are popping up all the time. They have to do something in order to not get left behind. No way, no, um, no qualms about it, but don't pretend like, you didn't want that interview. Don't pretend like you didn't want those have a million views his Breakfast Club interview got, right? Both of those interviews. The one where he went on all cocky and the one where he came back a bit with his, with his tail between his legs when he kind of felt the pressure for the feds. They want those hits. It makes no sense. And like, oh, this article it makes no sense even because they're stipulated at the end of it. Then you're going to play his music when, if the public forces them to like, if the public demands. And if you know anything about Takeshi 6 ix audience or consumers or fans or even his approach, the first thing he's gonna do when he comes out is troll hot in his hot ninety seven and get them to and get them to kind of fucking bombard Ebro Rosenberg and everyone else and Laura Styles Instagram page with comments about play to catch six nine right they're gonna be bombarding his page with all that so it doesn't make any sense why they're doing this anyway um it continues the fact is exec tells hot 97 tells us hot 97 has never been a huge to catch a 69 supporter and him ratting on his former gang members is digging an even bigger hole for himself like what do they so what like, what does that have to do with them? Why do they care about him writing? It makes no sense, right? Um, we wrote the story. One record label making a multi-million dollar investment into Catch 69, banking on him to get out of prison sooner rather than later, which is which is a great, shrewd investment. That's where you know you have your mind screwed on as an investor or as somebody that knows about money, right? To get take all the emotion out of it, take all the scenario out of it, take away his and who he is, the rainbow head, the tattoos, all the all, everything, all the beefs, and look at it just as a pure commodity this guy who was the hottest rapper in the world for a year as classic never said right is going to come out of prison right after a very protracted case right and this is you have to also remember there was a there was a time in place where people were thinking that he was pretending that he was from the streets and he had gang affiliations they didn't think it was real then it transpires that it actually was real he partook in some of the crimes allegedly through the court case documents and testimony and now he's on trial for it and he had to snitch his friends to get out for a fucking 49 year sentence that would have made him come out when he was 40, 69, right? That big meme that was going around. So this is a big deal. He went through a lot of the stuff in, in a year. So if you're an investment banker, if you're someone with, with your head screwed on, the first thing you're going to do when he gets out is put some money in his pocket, get him out there and, and perform, and then see that money triple and come back at you. Because if, if he's able to have a year that he did last year, just even a half a year this year with all the attention he's got on him, you're going to make your investment back in, in six months easy. So it makes some. It's, that's 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 why you have to kind of view it in the long term. And again, if you hold seven wanted to take a moral stance with it, why couldn't they get him on? Maybe educate the audience about what they see is not right and what he did, and maybe have a good conversation, maybe an argument, whatever it may be. That would effectively didn't help the station anyway in terms of views and subscriptions. So it makes it, it serves them no. It, it serves. It's probably you, they're leaving money on the table. They're effectively ruining their own quote unquote brand and their image amongst millennials and kids because they'll just see them as the old fuddy duds that can't embrace the youth. It makes no sense. And he just goes, he goes and takes all his views and his attention somewhere else. But anyway, what do I know? Um, while Hot 97 is firmly against giving 6 9 any radio play in the future, it says here, there's one scenario where the new uh, tunes could flood their, <laughs> their airways. The exec tells us Takeshi 6 9 will get spins only if there's a massive outcry from the masses over a huge successful song. Because in the end, capitalism thumps, trumps all. Oh, it makes no sense. Takeshi 6 ix prospects of performing Hot 97 wildly popular summer jam are also slim as none. The exec tells us that Takeshi 6 9 is totally liability and will not be allowed to take the stage at any future concert. But who cares? Summer jam has not been relevant for years. Even New York based artists or hip hop artists don't really care that much about it, right? They have a hard time booking some of the big people because there's, with the Rolling Loud smashing it recently, I think in New York recently now, and all these other festivals that are popping up, people are going to Coachella. Why would you care about going to Rolling? Why would you care about going to Hot and Hot, Hot and Seven Summer Jam? It makes no sense. Like, if anything, Takeshi Stein is probably doing them a favor more so than they're doing him a favor, aren't they? It's just there's a it's a bizarre state of affairs. I really don't understand their kind of this moral point of view or stance. And then at the end of it, you're playing this game. Oh, we're only going to play if the public demands we play it. It's like what? And again, like I said, he's going to be successful without them in, anyway, regardless. If he's able to keep his nose clean come out have a good documentary that kind of details his whole experience have a really good sit down interview with charlemagne or somebody else i don't know who's going to have it with or even the breakfast club and really get to the core of what happened and talk about it openly make a joke of himself turn himself into a meme maybe start putting a rat emoji or whatever and things next to his name right maybe start selling rat merch and stuff like really crazy funny like stuff that would make 
your average backpack rapper or, or fan of hip hop from the streets their blood boil if they were able to do that and really kind of kind of lean into the meme which he's kind of done in the past before right um you know with him swimming in his boxes running around r- running around with his top off um swimming in a swimming pool with DJ academics if he's able to lean into the meme he'll be fine and then all this stuff that all this posturing from all these radio stations this sort of kind of um hip hop virtue signaling will look fucking ridiculous as it already does anyway by the most part but yeah just an incredible state of affairs from 97 you could have you could have anticipated them for imagine right breakfast club are the one that had gave him you know amazing platform and allowed him to get off some of the best you know, content that he would imaginable and maybe get people to understand him a bit, a bit more. He was, you know, the meme came out that he kind of scored Charlemagne and trolled him with better than he would be able to troll, him, you know, him back. They were the ones that were quite front and center of this whole thing, right? A lot of the kind of, you know, rumors that came out were post his second interview when he was kind of starting to crumble, well, from the Breakfast Club. And they haven't inserted themselves into the conversation. They've not even said anything that I don't think publicly that much. Maybe Charlemagne says stuff in, on these podcasts with, with uh, Andrew Schultz, the brilliant idiots, but for the most part, they've kept them. They've kept their counsel. And ho- imagine Hot ninety seven, who has nothing to do with the show apart from Ebra having beef with him online, are the ones now kind of like poking their head and like, "Hey guys, what's going on here?" It's like, come on, man, have some dignity, man. It's so disgusting, shambolic, really, isn't it? Like, ugh. But what can you do, man? Old fogey is trying to keep their keep the lights on in their house, so you can't blame them in some respect. But yeah, not for me, not for me. Next year on the list, we have. Hot, oh, sorry, Boiler Room Festival. Did you guys go? I didn't go. Um, I kind of... Uh, what did I say? Was I snobby about it? Not really. I kind of thought it was a bit lame. I don't know. Did I think it was a bit lame? I don't know. I kind of had a weird view about it. But after seeing the videos, after seeing the, the breadth of artists that performed at this at this fucking festival, um, after seeing how fun it looked in the crowd for once, because I, I mentioned it previously, right, a few times that um, I have a really hard time uh, going to boiler rooms, even the really good ones, because for the most part, London crowds are really shit at boiler room. I think we're a bit too cool for school. There's too many hipsters here. We kind of, I don't know, we, we just we just generally don't really do boiler rooms that well. After going to a Berlin boiler room a few times, right, I've been talking about Berlin so much lately, but whatever, it's my podcast. Having gone there a few times, I've realized that, you know, the way we do bur- boiler room isn't as good, or maybe it wasn't as good as it was in the past, right? There's probably a bit too much awareness of the cameras or something like it, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, all that being said, the boiler room festival, absolutely smashed that apart right it kind of went back to the roots of what boiler was about it looked super fun it was a really great idea very very well executed and again i think such a great um tool and maybe a good avenue for what boiler want to do in the future it kind of looks like they've realized that there's only so much there's only so many brand partnerships they can do there's only so much times that they can kind of quote unquote whore out their name or attach their name to a brand sponsorship and get them to kind of slap their logos all over the place. Or something like that. There's so many they can do. If they're able to do more of these festivals in different locations around the world and charge a ticket entry fee, it's going to be it's gonna be amazing, right? And you get the added advantage of being on camera if you're a punter. You get to buy some merch there. Maybe if there's some merch there, blah, blah. They get a drink sponsorship and you get make money in the bar. There's so many cool things that they can do going forward. And I think it's such a great idea. Something that I'm surprised they haven't done sooner. So if you're not aware of it, Boiler Festival took took place in London. I'm, I'm pretty, they might end up doing it in other locations from the what was the date from the 9th to the 10th of, of August of October. Sorry, four day festival. Each day was split into different genres of of yeah things, right? Uh, genres. So day one was jazz, as seen on the screen here. Day two was rap. Day three was bass, and day four was club. So each so each kind of they kind of signify a different sort of genre of music they're kind of aiming towards. I'm not sure if it was a different venue or the same venue, but for the most part, for the stream, I think I saw two or three venues in there. But again, each day was stacked full of people. Here's a here's the kind of um, uh, website on it. Sounds about Absolute Vodka. Four days, one city, no headliners. Centered around Peckham, the Boiler Room. Oh, it's around Peckham. Awesome. Um, the Boiler Room Festival will push the boundaries of the traditional festival, intimate raw in, in, in the in the round, showcasing a different underground scene each day. The multi-event program will feature emerging artists from contemporary jazz, rap, bass, and club culture. This isn't about the headliners. It's about the next generation. It's not about anyone in any one artist. It's about the communities they thrive on, which is amazing, right? So it's idea about you know propping up this new generation giving them exposure on, on obviously Boiler which is a huge platform for people to kind of get exposure on and just in general and a bit uh, a very good um, way for com- consumers and maybe even brands and sponsors to see what kind of poor and audience Boiler Room can kind of attract because these kind of all fall into different sort of categories different brands might be want to be associated with sort of music it was a really good calling kind of really good advertisement of what the power of Boiler Room is basically essentially and again a four day festival each each day different day different artists jazz you got all the artists here which I'm probably not that familiar with um, you got rap you got some good people on there as well you got Amari Washington 
Um, you got who else? You got you got DWE on the rap, which is interesting. Uh, you got DJ Nip Tizzle, Amy Becker, and stuff. Great people there on bass. You got all the usual people in there. Bass and Perks so again. I'm who I'm familiar with. Lucy, I'm familiar with. Jubilee, uh, Nidia, I'm, I'm familiar with. Youngster, I'm familiar with. And then Club Culture, you've got all the ones that I'd want to go see. Right, uh, Pateka, BBZ, Becky Tong, DJ Stingray, Doc Sleep, um, Sam, um, MC, M, L, X, 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 V, which I'm going to play in a minute, Sherelle, Shy One, like great, 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 great artists playing um, throughout the days. Again, um, really, really good um, lineup. I'm a real big fan of it. I think the tickets were pretty cheap as well, right, for the most part. Um, so, what was a four day pass? Four day pass was £50, man. Wow, one idiot for not going. I was so so much of a snob to go and not go. I don't know. Ballroom is it's probably because it's too young for me. The kids going in now. I don't know. I should have. I should have went. Look at that. Fifty pounds. Amazing. So the the ones that sold out were the jazz and club. Okay, first day of jazz and first day of club culture. So that's interesting, isn't it? Rap and bass didn't sell out. Interesting, right? Jazz and thing. I wonder why jazz sold out. Maybe because they had really big people in jazz that I'm not really familiar with. That's amazing. The jazz and thing. But again, to see all those people at, at the jazz festival, right? There's over there's only over ten names artists on there. To see everyone there, if you got early bird tickets, fifteen pounds. Final release was twenty seven fifty. That's a bargain anyway, regardless. But for a four day pass of fifty quid, that is insanely good. That is insanely good. Um so yeah, they they smashed it. A really good event for the most part from what I saw. And like I mentioned beforehand, I saw um my favorite um uh, um probably performance was probably Sam. They played really well. And then um, the other one, uh, a duo DJ in there, um, Hector Oaks and some other dude, I forgot his name. Um, but essentially, the one that really, really stood out for me was um, MCMLXXXV. Um, he absolutely smashed it, played a really amazing set, loads of techno, loads of electro, um, just loads of interesting cool stuff. He, he, play, he even played a Tiesto track that I, I completely forgot about um, from years gone by, which I'm going to actually, let me see if I can find it here. I think I shazammed it. He played a fucking Tiesto track. That I was like, oh my God, I haven't heard this in years. Um, and it made you realize again, you know, okay, there's a reason why Chester is like, you know, one of the most well paid, if not the well paid artists in the world, right? He he makes some fucking good music, or he has made good music in the past. Um, he still does anyway. Yeah, a, a tune called Traffic by Chester. He played that as well in a set that was just insane. I'm gonna get a, get get it up on here now for you guys to see and listen to a little bit. Hopefully, you guys can check this out here. This is this is um M C M L x x x v i'll put the the the, the link in the show notes for you guys to check it out Stepping but it's a really interesting set the resident let me MC. just forward a little bit from the announcer talking but it's really good he, he actually presented it really really well to be honest um that's a kind of dream anyway to have him introduce you right sort of like joe rogan he's yeah he's like he's like our dj version of joe rogan isn't he <laughs> so yeah amazing he had he had his great he had his friends in the background going crazy the guy in the white in the white vest to his left was smashing it maybe it might be boyfriend i'm not too sure there was a real weird beef between the girl here as well at the back that was kind of going a bit too crazy. Um, she was getting too close to the decks as he was mixing. We tried to get her away and she wouldn't get away and eventually his friends just had to kind of like come and kind of like push her out of it but she was super, super, super fucked up. Hopefully, here, hope you can see the girl at the back. She's kind of wearing a black vest but yeah, it was a really, really good set. I really recommend check it out. One of my favorite sets of the, of the weekend and again, I'm so gutted I didn't go. Like, what an idiot. What an idiot for not going. But here, listen to a bit of it now. Is it me or or or, or, or the EQs on those? What is that? That's not best. What's it called? Those mixes are a lot better than the pioneers, isn't it? It's just a lot of like silencing. It just really mutes the the highs and the mids and the lows. I think it's one of those mixes that also has two highs and two mo mid lows as well, which is quite cool. But yeah, that's the girl down the left hand side, right there. If you can see her, right? So to, no, sorry, to his left or to the screen's left. That girl there was the one that was getting in trouble a little bit. She had a bit of beef. Like she was barging into people, like just being a bit of a nuisance. But yeah, the dancing was amazing. Loads of real cool club kids came out. Again, probably one of the best vibes I've seen so far from a boiler room. Smash it. This twice a little bit so you can see. See, that's the girl there. She's going a bit too crazy. <laughs> Look how close she is. Elbows everywhere. <laughs> they have to get her out of it eventually she moves out of the way and they kind of push her out but yeah i recommend you check it out really really cool set by mcm uh, xxv absolutely smashed it oh she's still there actually in the front she was she stayed around for a while isn't it oh no that's another girl so it's another girl that came in there but yeah really cool set um again one i recommend you check it out i'll put in the show notes for you guys to see yourself but yeah mcm sm absolutely smashed it 
and again check him out where you can see him and again like i said boy room festival looked amazing i was um gutted to not go myself i think again i had my snobby hat on they probably thought i was over it or too big for it or whatever it may be cool but having seen the images and seeing the videos and people enjoying themselves and in general just the idea behind like i said like 50 quid for all those artists to see all those people playing in one arena right for for four days it's just an insane value for money that's just insane how good that is 50 quid for a ticket that's just wow what a, good, what a great idea and again like i said i think it's a good idea for them going forward good revenue stream they can't keep on doing sponsors all the year all year round they have to mix up a little bit and this is probably a good way to go do it right have some money coming in you got money from the door um uh, money from the tickets sold money from the bar money from the merchants are selling that on site too which would be an easy thing to do and just in general just a great approach and i was wondering if in the future we're going to get an uh, we're going to get an, an occasion where boiler room will make a portal where they'll post pictures up so you can get pictures off their site watermarked and fucked up and small or they can give you high-res image of everyone that was at this event and if you see yourself you can buy the image for like a couple of quid I, I'd, I'd do that i think you'd get quite a lot of buyers 99p for each image you just you just get be able to buy the images of you and your friends having a good time that'd be pretty cool i'm not sure if that's possible um but that'd be quite amazing if they was able to do that would it be amazing i don't know if it'd be amazing interesting a revenue stream because again i'm like I'm, I, I i imagine this is a a ploy to get more money coming in right because there's only so many brands punches again like i keep saying that you can do you have to do something else out of it but maybe pictures are not a good thing the merch is doing really well i see a lot of people wearing the merch out and about they don't look because before when i used to see people wearing merch they look at the kind of people that worked at boiler room right the kind of you know black trousers white socks white reebok workouts crowd um the people that always carried around i don't know like a funny tote bag or you know <laughs> those kind of things or hard wax tote bags like those kind of people but now i'm seeing regular folk wearing uh, the t-shirts which is good it shows that you know the brand because it's, it's quite hard to wear for instance like i had depop t-shirt depop merch because i used to work there right so when people see me wearing depop merch they immediately assume that i used to work there because it's quite odd to see somebody wearing depop merch that doesn't have any affiliation with depop but once you cross over and you become a big enough brand or the appeal or you have a resonance with your customers or with people that are using the app where they want to support the brand as well and it's not just an auxiliary item like, you're never gonna see someone wearing an ebay hoodie right people just sell on there and keep it moving but people actually love depot people love boiler room so it makes sense that in the future you'd probably see people wearing the merch more often because you know they just want to be associated with it they want the association they want you to see boiler room see them and all make you think they're cool because if they like boiler room, that means they're into this kind of music it means they're into this subculture it means they have this sort of political leanings they have this sort of worldview immediately kind of you kind of su are able to surmise them as a person um pretty quickly over just the period just for them wearing a, a neon green long sleeve um boiler room t-shirt or some shit but yeah by and large Great idea for them going forward. I'm interested to see how this is going to develop. Interested to see if they're going to do it. If they do it another city, I'll be gutted because that means I can't go to the next one next year. And again, it's quite fun to go to festivals the first year round, especially when they when they just set up because they're a bit fucked up. It's long to queue. The bars are not set up properly. And then you, you go in the preceding years and it starts to get better and better. I quite I quite like the idea of growing with festivals. I don't know with a few other places, especially in club nights and stuff like that. You start going places the first couple of times, it's a bit shit, and then it suggests gets better and better over time, correct? So I hope they do it again in London, but I'm almost surprised they kind of move it around the country or move it around the world. Which which would be quite cool to see um going forward and all that malarkey but yeah first one in london makes sense because that's where it started and all that malarkey but yeah um looks good man looks good uh big up boy room for that so yeah big up everyone that went if you did go let me know how you how you like did you like it did you enjoy it do you have a good time um is there anything that you would change about it going forward um let me know in the comments let me know in the comments what else is here do, 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 do. What else we got here? What else we got here? Oh, we got um a DJ Harvey interview. Should I end with that one or should I no, say that for now? Yes, yeah, say that for tomorrow. So let's because we're already an hour in. We don't want to go a bit too long than this. So we're an hour in. Thank you much again for tuning in. I'll save the DJ Harvey interview for tomorrow. For those of you guys watching via YouTube, it's your first time here. Give me a thumbs up and a comment and a subscribe. That'll be sick if you if you want to hang around and see more videos from myself. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five star review will go a long way to help spread the show. If you're on the podcast app and you want to check my socials, they're all on there too. Listed underneath the webs, underneath my in the description. Sorry, I'll put a link to that set that I thought was the best at the Boiler Room Festival as well. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show, right? Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah, I'll see you guys tomorrow. So take care, have a good one, and I'll see you again very, very soon. Bye, peace. <laughs>